Well, growing up as a kid, um, around our house, we had these strange little things all over the place, especially in the basement. They looked like this, uh, just kind of uh, melty, weird things with a rough base and these smooth, um, melted pyramids on the top. And my dad was an artist, so I just figured, you know, this is, this is part of his expression, man. He's just letting something out. And I had no idea what they were. They were very bizarre until one day my dad, who had his pottery studio in the basement, called me over and said, hey, I want to show you how I fire the kiln to heat up the, uh, the pottery and melt the glazes. And he took one of these, except it looked differently, that all those little cones were sticking straight up in the air. I said, Dad, what are those? I see those all over. He said, oh, these things, you put them in here right near this little portal you can look through. And as they melt, each one melts at a different temperature and a different rate. And so once they've reached a certain angle or some of them are completely melted, I know that the kiln has been hot enough and fired long enough pr to produce what I want to produce, to melt the glazes at the right uh, speed and time. And, and this was back in the 70s before they had perfectly temperature controlled kilns with timers on them and everything. So they don't use them anymore. But it opened my eyes to realize that there are things around us that just look like pointless pieces of whatever that is. But they actually serve an incredibly important, highly aligned purpose. And one of those things is prayer. Sometimes prayer can seem like just something you do before you eat and before bedtime. I mean, I remember growing up, I just thought prayer was something you had to do to let the food cool, you know? It was, you just do it to make sure everyone's at the table, everyone's paying attention, and then you go. And then uh, raising kids myself, I remember keeping one eye open and seeing them reach slowly for the food during prayer. We're like, no, no. And so they, I don't know why they thought we prayed, but the, maybe others of you think of prayer as just a regimented thing you're supposed to do. It's just something you have to do. You say these exact words at this right time, and it does something to you or for you or for God or whatever. But prayer is actually something God uses to tune our lives. The great potter who has built us to be what he wants us to be uses it to strengthen us, to bring beauty and purpose to our lives and even though others on the outside may not quite understand why are people kneeling at the front here, what in the world is that about? Or why did we take time in our service just to stop and do something that didn't seem to produce anything or, or attract people? And I'm sure those watching online were like, what is going on right now? What was going on was God was tuning us. He was heating us. He was making sure we were getting to the right place so we could be who he created us to be, but also so things could happen in our future that we don't even know are coming. Our big idea today is that prayer has many purposes. Prayer has many purposes. We're in our 21 days of prayer and fasting. This last week has been amazing, at least for my experience and many of you who've been part of prayer last Sunday night. If you came out for that, that was an incredible time. Um, I, was, I was walking up and down the side aisle there crying, and I was a little embarrassed of it. So I was raising my hand, oh, God, you're so good, looking out at all the people responding in worship and prayer, and I'm just sobbing because God's so good, and people are hungry for God and responding to him every morning this week, except Saturday morning. We came out 7.30 to 8.30 to pray. We had an incredible time of prayer every day this week. Uh, we prayed for every room and every door uh, in, this, in this place. It was just incredible, and and wonderful times of connection. And uh, then going forward, we have two more weeks of prayer. We're not meeting every week or every morning, but we're meeting Wednesday mornings from 7.30 to 8.30, Sunday mornings 9 to 9.30. Come on out and be a part of those. And some of you are like, I do not like prayer. Like Christy feels about, about fasting. Maybe that's how you feel about prayer. Like, I know I should like it. I know it's supposed to be helpful and supposed to be what I do. But there's something in you, you just don't like it. That's okay. That's how I feel about working out. I don't like it. 
But would it produce good things in my life if I did it? Yes, it would. Now, I'm still getting there. You can pray for me as a congregation. Help our pastor work out. Boy, you can tell he needs it by looking at him. But prayer is like that. It produces good things. And the more you do it, just like working out, so I've heard, you end up loving it and craving it and wanting to do it because it produces good things in your life. So we're going to look at the word of the Lord today. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 is where we're going to start. But at Highland Church, we believe that the Bible is the word of God, inspired through the Holy Spirit, protected by the Lord for the generations, that it's living and active, and that it's relevant for our lives today. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be anxious about anything. So prayer is an antidote to anxiety. It is a pathway to peace. It is an opportunity for us to say thank you for the good things, to make supplication for our needs, and to communicate with God. And if you remember last week, that's how we defined prayer, and that's how we'll continue to define it. Prayer is communication with God. So it's expressing yourself to him. That can be through words. That can be through thoughts. That can be through creative things, through song. It can be through work even. Work can be prayer. It's communication with, back and forth with God, so to him, but also receiving from him what he wants to say to you. And then it's God. Not just the universe, not the energy, not the vibrations, but the God who knows you better than you know yourself and loves you more than anyone or anything has ever loved you. That's what prayer is, communication with God. So let's look at some of the many purposes of prayer. There's no way we can cover them all today, but there's three key purposes of prayer we're going to look at. The first one is that prayer builds our relationships. Prayer builds our relationships. It actually strengthens our connections relationally. I don't know about you, but in my mind, prayer has always been a very solitary thought. It's always been something that I kind of think like, oh yeah, you go alone and pray. Or when you pray, it's just you and God. Or maybe it's your family if you're praying at bedtime or praying for your food. Or maybe to you, you know this already. You're like, well, of course. But, but it's always been you standing, looking forward, praying words with a group of other people. So it hasn't always seemed connective relationally. Maybe corporate might be a better way you think of prayer. But God's plan for prayer has always been relational. Always intended to be a connection. In Acts 2, when, when God birthed the church, so what happened is, Jesus came to earth. He has always existed, but he came to earth. He was born of a Virgin Mary. We just celebrated his birth uh, on Christmas. And then he rose and grew up and became a man and led others and then was killed on the cross, buried in a borrowed tomb, but three days later rose from the dead. And then he saw 500 people after he rose from the dead, connected with them, taught with them, ate with them, and then he ascended into heaven. And he told his disciples, go and wait in Jerusalem for the gift the Father is going to give you. So they did. The Holy Spirit was poured out. And Peter, who beforehand, Peter was the one that Jesus turned to and said, get behind me, Satan. Peter was the one who ran away when Jesus was arrested. Peter was the one who said, no, don't wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. Then Peter said, okay, give me a bath. Wash all of me. And Jesus said, no, no, no. You've already been cleaned. I just need to wash your feet. Peter's all over the place. Peter, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, stands up and preaches the first sermon of the church age and 3,000 people become born-again followers of Jesus Christ. 
3,000 people step into a relationship with the Lord, and they say, what do we do? We don't have a church building. We don't have a structure. There's no church growth or management software out there for us to use to manage all these people. What do we do? And what they did is they would get together. They would talk about the Word of God. They would sing songs. They would encourage one another, and they would pray together. And that connection with God and each other is what caused the church not just to ex- exist, but to expand. That that relationship got bigger and bigger. The Bible says God added to their number daily those who were getting saved. So already 3,000 got saved in Jerusalem. And every day, more and more people are getting saved because they're connecting with other humans. They're building relationship. God's plan for a relationship with him is that we also have a relationship with others. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 18, 19 through 20. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. There is strength when we come together and pray. There's strength when we link up with one another and agree about anything. Two or three people is all it takes. Well, we have hundreds here today. And when we pray and agree about things, there's a connection. There's a unity. God's like, that's, that's what I'm talking about. But praying aloud with another person, now that's scary. How many of you would love it if I just called you up front here to pray right now? Some of you would be like, yeah, totally, no big deal. Either because you've never done it and you're like, you don't know that you'll be terrified, or others, you're like, I can picture exactly what would happen, and I'm not going to do it. Praying is the natural, or should I say supernatural, state that humans are created to exist in. We were created to have constant communion and communication with God while being with others. We read in Genesis, the very beginning, God came down and walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Every day, two people and God met together to talk. That's God's purpose and plan. Prayer is not meant to be a solo sport. It's meant to be an experience we do with others. The Bible even says, That one in the power and strength of God, one person can put a thousand enemies to flight. Send a thousand enemies running for the hills. So how many should two be able to send? Two should send 2,000. But the Bible says two send 10,000 to flight. So when we gather together, when we let our faith connect with each other and with the Lord... There's an exponential, more than exponential, geometric multiplication of the effectiveness of our prayer. Why would God do it that way? Because God is so committed that we don't have this solo, alone relationship with God. And the American church, at least my experience in it, we have focused so much on your personal relationship with Jesus which is incredibly important. You need to be connected to the Lord. But we have done it to the extent that we've forgotten our communal relationship with the Lord. The Bible says that God is coming back for his church. It doesn't say he's coming back for you. That the church is his bride. Not that you are his bride. That the church, the gathering of believers, I'm not talking the building or or assemblies of God. I'm talking the global group of believers who love Jesus and worship him in different cultures, in different languages, in different places, in different countries. That all of us together are the body of Christ. Not the bodies of Christ, The singular body of Christ. There's supposed to be such a deep union among us that we are one. All diversity of gifts, diversity of thoughts and insights and strengths and weaknesses, just like a human body, my hand is terrible at seeing things. It can't see anything. It needs my eyes, but boy, do my eyes need my hand so I can grab things and do things. 
We need the diversity, but we need to be connected or we're missing out. So one can put 1,000 to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. That's why I think I have just fallen in love with our Wednesday morning prayer. You guys hear me talk about it so much, you're like, get over it, dude. Except for those of you that are a part of it. And you're like, yes, it's true. It's so good. You don't have to come to that one. Find one or two other people and get together and pray. Carve out little times of your life to pray. God's plan is that prayer is relational. And I love those people more than I used to. And I loved all of them already. But I have a deeper love, a deeper like, a deeper understanding, a deeper connection than I had a year ago before we started meeting. So God wants prayer to connect us with other people, not isolate us from others. And let's be honest, there's a vulnerability when you pray with someone else. It's a little scary. You're like, what if I say something stupid? What if I swear while I'm praying? Because that's what I do the rest of the time I communicate. Okay. Then you say, sorry, guys. And they're like, okay, don't do it again, but we love you. What if I say something totally unbiblical? Well, praise the Lord, you're doing it with other people who can help you not get stuck in that way of thinking, but can gently say, oh, actually, the Bible says this, or actually, this is who God is. Or actually, no, Satan doesn't have that kind of control over you because you have the victory in Jesus Christ that we have that kind of connection with others. It's safe, but it's also empowering. The second part of the relational is God relationship. Obviously, Psalm 145.18 says this, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. God gets close when you talk to him. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, let's talk, let's chat, come on, let's sit down together. Let's be close. Let's hang out. Let me hear what's on your heart. Let me draw near to you. And some of you feel far from God. Pray. Make prayer a regular part. Put it on your phone as a reminder if you need to. I do that with other important things. Why not with prayer? Let it be a regular thing because God will draw close when you pray. Pray. Prayer is about connection. And as we call on him, we sense his presence more and more. And, and this verse and even scripture tends to encourage the fact that God focuses on those who are praying. Now, God can see all things at all time. He's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. That means he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere. But there does appear throughout Scripture special presences of God over the Ark of the Covenant. When they were gathered then also in the upper room and what appeared to be tongues of fire over their head. When we come to God, he meets us there in a special sense of his presence. And that's sometimes when we come to church, we can feel God more because we're gathered together with a focus and he's like, oh, I am paying attention at a level you didn't even know was possible. I am focused on you. I love you. I want you to know I am with you. During prayer this week, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, uh, someone just shared about that. This year, they really sensed God, and this is someone I trust and believe. They're not just spouting stuff to hear their own voice, but that we're going to start seeing the manifest presence of God in our church family. Now, for those of you that don't know what that means, that means we're going to see miracles. We're going to see God show up and do things that are impossible for humans to do emotionally, physically, relationally, that God is going to manifest his presence here. You hear a lot about that word manifest these days, that you would manifest this for yourself, that you would speak it into existence. All of that is stolen from the Bible. But what's supposed to happen is that you don't manifest it. It's not your energy that makes that happen or your will. It is God who shows up to manifest things. And let me tell you, when God manifests his purposes, his plan, his healing, his redemption, it happens. It's real. It's not just a whim or how, how spiritual can you get yourself. It is the presence of God 
showing up to tell you you matter. That what you do makes a difference. That he loves you. So when we pray, we connect with God. When things get, get noisy, they get our attention. In fact, you know, with Teslas and a lot of the electric cars now, they are actually hiring sound designers to make the cars make more noise when they drive down the road because they're so silent, they're running into people because people don't hear the car. We're used to hearing the engine run, and with the electric cars, you don't hear them because they're just... Which is kind of cool until it hits someone because they couldn't hear it. We need noise to get our attention. The Bible says the children of Israel, when they were in slavery for 400 years, started to cry out to the Lord. And their cries reached heaven, and God moved and set them free and brought them to the promised land. Sometimes we've just resigned ourselves to like, well, okay, if God wants it different, he'll change it. And God's saying, call out to me. Be in relationship with me. Let's talk. Because I like you, and I want you to like me, and I want us to communicate, but we've just, well, I prayed once, and if God wants to do it, he'll do it. And he gives us this example in the Bible of a a widow who has been mistreated, who's going to a judge and knocking on his door, saying, I need you to rule correctly in my case. I have been mistreated. I need you to show up. And she does not stop. And the judge, the Bible says, though he is evil, goes down and meets her. Well, God is not evil. God is good. And some of us have given up on prayers because we didn't see the answer in the time we want. And God's saying, hey, this is about relationship. Not about you just getting what you want, but I want you to draw close to me. Don't give up. Keep coming back. It's not just an opportunity to open up with the Lord, but it's an invitation from God to be close with him to know him. So prayer builds relationships between others and God, but then prayer also strengthens our faith. Prayer's purpose, one of them is to strengthen our faith. If you struggle with faith, in fact, I had someone sit down in my office this week that isn't even a believer yet, but they're on the journey and they're studying scripture and they're listening to sermons and they're getting commentaries. I'm like, I wish most of us studied the word like you're studying the word and you don't even believe yet. And this person said, well, someday I will accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but I'm not there yet because it's here, but I don't know that I believe it in my heart and I don't want to pray a prayer I don't mean. I was like, whoa, truth right there. But he said, how do I have faith? How do I believe? What is it that I do to believe? And I said, you pray. You ask God for the gift of faith. That's what we see in scriptures, that God gives us the gift of faith. We see this story in Mark 9, 24. This is a centurion, a a Roman soldier overseeing other soldiers, and their child was sick, and they wanted Jesus to come and heal this little one. And they believed that Jesus could do it because that's what the rumors were. Everyone was saying Jesus heals people, Jesus heals people, but he hadn't seen it himself. But he had a need that caused him to cross cultural lines, caused him to cross societal lines and socioeconomic lines because he had a need that he was not going to follow status quo to find an answer. He was going to press in. And so he believes at a certain level, but he knows he's not there yet. He knows he's still missing. And so this is what he, we see here. Immediately, the father of a ch- the child cried out and said, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but help me have more faith. I have faith, but I know I'm not there yet, so please help me. So if you need more faith, if you have a hard time having faith, ask God for the grace to believe. And he will. He'll strengthen it. He'll give it to you. Even when you have faith, maybe you're a person where you're like, man, faith is my spiritual gift. I just got faith. Pray for more faith. There's always more faith that God has to dump out on us, to give us. For some of you, you look at others and you're like, it's so easy for them to believe. Well, yeah, look at their life. It's so easy. Of course they have faith, but I haven't experienced that. Well, the same God that did the stuff for them is your God. 
So everything that has happened to them, you get to account to yourself because it's the same God. Put faith in God because of what you've seen in another person's life. When I hear testimonies from other people, it strengthens my faith. Though God did it in their life. That's the beauty of God and this connection that God wants is even other people's miracles build your faith. That's one of the reasons we need to be in connection with each other, relationships, sharing testimonies with each other. I got a text last Sunday that just told me what God was doing in the life of somebody, uh, two people, and it put the biggest smile on my, fa- my face, my faith, I wasn't going to say that, but that was also true. My faith was like, oh, yeah, yes. What God did in someone else's life strengthens me. So I want to encourage you, even if you haven't had a lot of experience, talk with those who have, and your faith will be built. This is the picture that God gives us in Scripture. The last couple days, uh, it's been snowy and cold. I don't know if you noticed that at all. But we had a fire in our fireplace for two days. We have a wood-burning fireplace, and we'd get it going just because it feels cozy. Warms the house a little bit, but more it's the ambience of it. And uh, we'd get busy doing something or be out shoveling and come in, and there would just be glowing embers left. That would all, all that would be left. And so what I would do is I'd break up some kindling, put it in there, put another log on the fire, and then I would do this. and blow on the embers. There was no fire there, just smoldering embers. And within a few seconds, the fire lights up, and then it grows. Did you know that God does that for those of us whose faith is little? He says, a smoldering ember I will not snuff out. But you get close to God and he breathes on you. His spirit, his ruach, the living breath of God breathes on you. And what, what used to be roaring and is faded, all of a sudden whoo, comes back to life. And becomes something that you thought was done. Man, those days back in the early 2000s, late 90s, God was really moving then. But it seems like he isn't moving anymore. Boy, when I was a teenager, God was really moving Boy, when I was at camp this summer, God was really moving. Boy, when we sang those kinds of songs, then God would really move. Come close to him. Let him breathe on you. He says, I got you. I got you. I will bring you through. Let me build your faith. There's another story here in Matthew 22, 18 through 22, and we're not going to read it all, but what's happening is this is the week of Jesus' death. And I can imagine Jesus' emotions are all over the place because he was 100% God, but he was also 100% human. So yes, he had all the power and strength and presence of God, but he also had all the emotion and weakness and struggles of a human, and he knows he's about to face death. And he walks by this fig tree, and it hasn't produced any fruit. It's just leaves and no figs, and he's mad. Because he wants figs. You ever have a craving for something? You just want it now. Now with DoorDash and all that, we can get it like 20 minutes and we got what we're craving for. But you can't make figs grow. In fact, what's interesting, this tree wasn't even in season to produce figs. So Jesus shouldn't even have expected it to be there. But he's just in a mood. (sighs) Now Jesus never sinned. And that gives us peace that we we can get angry without sinning. The Bible even says, be angry, but don't sin in your anger. And he curses the tree. He said, this tree will never bear fruit again. And immediately, one translation shows us, or one of the gospels shows us the next day they saw, but out of Matthew, it says, immediately it shriveled up and died. And the disciples are like, what? Did you guys just see that? What just happened? Now, this kind of shocks me that they were so amazed because this is the same group of guys that was with Jesus when he stood up in the boat and said, be still, and the storm stopped. It's the same group of guys that was with Jesus when he called Lazarus out of the grave and Lazarus rose from the dead. Same group of guys who passed out the food to feed 5,000 people out of the lunch of a little kid. But something about this, they were like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. And Jesus says, if you have faith, you will do greater things than this. 
The mountains will be cast into the sea. These guys are like, what? Us? No. But what Jesus is saying is, you've seen this all from me, but now it's time for you to start using it. Start you to start engaging in faith. And then we see these disciples bring healing to people. We see these disciples with strength to stand in the face of death and declare the Lord. Be able to stand in their faith. But faith is like muscle. You got to work it out. It's like bench pressing. At first, you can only do a little bit. I know I'm talking about working out a lot today. But it's like going to the gym. Sometimes faith starts small. Jesus talks about faith as a mustard seed pretty tiny little thing, but it'll grow into a tree. So you start where you are, okay? You don't need faith to raise the dead today. You need faith to ask for faith today. Jesus, will you give me faith? And then use it the next day. It's a weight-lifting faith. It grows over time. It gets stronger the more you use it until you're surprised at how much faith there is. So it's a gift from God, but it's an invitation for us to act. Finally, prayer gives us purpose. Prayer gives us purpose, but through prayer, we discover our purpose because God talks to us. He tells us stuff about himself, about our future, about why we exist. Seek him, and he'll talk to you. If you don't know what to do, ask God. If you're in a situation where you're like, should I take this job or not? Should I enter into this relationship or not? Should I start this new hobby or not? Should I buy this vehicle or not? Ask God. Ask God what his plans and purposes are. If you look at the Lord's Prayer, the very beginning of it tells us to focus on his will instead of ours. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So seek God's kingdom and God's will in your prayer. You will find your purpose in his plans. I want to be in his plans. I don't want him trying to fix my plans. I don't want to tell him what he should be doing in my life. I want to say, what's your plan, God? It's way better than mine. Let me get on board. James 1.5 puts it like this. If any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. God will make things more clear to you when you pray. He'll close certain doors and open certain doors. Christy and I have been in the process as she's been looking at getting a job saying, God, just open doors and close doors. Doors that are from you, let them swing wide. Doors that aren't from you, close them tight. Pray that kind of prayer in your life. Ask God to show you what his will is. He will, if you'll give him enough time. And this is what I found many times when he shows me his will. I don't always like it because it's not the way I would have done it. But that's why I'm going to the God of the universe for advice and not myself. He knows better than I do. He knows better than each of us. So ask God to guide you. As we've been reading through the book of Proverbs as a church, it's just God's wisdom after God's wisdom after God's wisdom after God's wisdom. Seek him and he'll guide you. He'll lead you. He'll direct you. Matthew 6, 6 through 7, our last verse of the day. Worship team, you can come on up. This one says something that seems to kind of go against the rest of what we've said today, but you'll see why it says this. But when you pray... Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. What's going on here is Jesus is confronting the societal norms of the day, which was prayer was meant to be performed at a temple or on a street corner. That's what the people thought. If I pray a really elaborate, pretty, fancy prayer in front of people, they will be impressed. And God is saying, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what impresses me. It might impress people, but it doesn't impress me. Prayer is meant to be a connection with God. It's meant to strengthen our faith. Even if you can do nothing Physically, 
Maybe your body is weak. Maybe you have illnesses or, or problems that keep you from being able to do normal volunteer work at church or anywhere else. Maybe you can't even have a job because of the challenges you have. Maybe you have intellectual disabilities that keep you from being able to operate at a level that others think you should operate at. Maybe you have emotional hindrances that keep you from being able to even talk to another person. You can still pray. When I visit our shut-ins, they'll say, well, what's my point? What's my purpose? Why am I still here? Why hasn't God taken me home yet? And every time I say, because you're a prayer warrior. You sitting here in your home and you can't get out. You in the nursing home, you are a prayer warrior. You get 24-7 prayer time. That is a purpose that is greater than anything else. It's like the snow plow that goes down the road and pushes back all the snow so everyone else can get through. While this frail little person who everyone else has forgotten about sits alone in their home, the God of the universe hears them and is on the move, pushing back the limitations for the rest of us. Prayer is your purpose. If you can do nothing else, prayer is your purpose. If you can do everything else, prayer is your purpose. Do nothing without praying. Jesus said he did nothing without first hearing the voice of his father. How did he hear that voice? Well, the Bible tells us very early in the morning and it was still dark. Jesus got up and went to a solitary place and prayed. I mean, if Jesus has to pray... We really need to pray. If Jesus needs to hear the voice of the Father, boy, you and I, we need the voice of the Father. And that's the invitation he gives to us today. One of the phrases I've said is, if you have a pulse, you have a purpose. So no matter what your abilities are, your strengths or weaknesses, if you have a pulse, you have a purpose. And that first purpose is prayer. So talk with God. Communicate with your Creator. Hear him, speak to him, believe for him. It's a purpose we can all be a part of. So today we talked about prayer having many, many purposes. It's about relationship. It's about building our faith. It's about our purpose. And as we wrap it up here, I just want to invite those of you today who may not have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you don't talk with him. Maybe you don't communicate with him. You've never asked Jesus to forgive you for what you've done wrong and lead your life. And you want to do that today. You're like, man, if God's inviting me into this connection through prayer to him and others, I want that. Well, what Jesus tells us to do is confess our sins and we'll be forgiven. To believe that he's risen from the dead and to call him Lord and we'll be saved. So I'm just going to pray a simple prayer that I'd ask you to agree with me in your heart as I pray it out loud. To ask Jesus to come in to forgive and lead you. Let's pray. Jesus, I ask that you would forgive me for everything I've done wrong. Every time I've fallen short of the mark, that you would wipe that off my record, Lord Jesus. I'm sorry for the sin I've committed in my life. For the things I haven't done that I should, I give it all to you. And I believe that you're alive today. I believe that you love me, even though I may not feel worthy of love. And I want you to be the leader of my life, the God of my life, the guide of my life. I give you my life today, Lord Jesus. Will you fill me up with your Holy Spirit today? Thank you for your salvation and relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Bob, would you come?